I would like you all to take a moment and picture someone you consider a world-changing entrepreneur. Got it? I have a hunch that many of you may have pictured this guy, or this guy, or this other white guy. <laughs> These are often the images we think of when we think of what it means to be a world-changing entrepreneur. Mercurial characters who dropped out of college, hacked away alone in their garage, and delivered the world something the rest of us couldn't have imagined. And there is no doubt these guys have changed our lives. They've given us iPhones we can't find our way around without, cars on demand, and the ability to check our ex's Facebook status whenever we want to. And I think we can all admit amongst friends that's generally too often. But today I want to argue that there are limits to this vision of entrepreneurship especially when we're counting on entrepreneurs to solve big societal problems. Before we get into what kind of entrepreneurs we need, though, let's talk a little bit about why we need them. We need world-changing entrepreneurs because we live in an age of wicked problems. I'm sure you can all think of a few right now. Ending world hunger, solving poverty, taking on climate change. And I don't use the word wicked because these are inherently evil, though many of these problems leave people at a massive disadvantage. I use the word wicked problem because they're uniquely resistant to change and difficult to solve. Why is that? A couple reasons. Wicked problems are very complex. They're made up of hundreds of interconnected causes, layered stakeholders. They're hard to solve. Second, they don't have single solutions. Trying to take on a wicked problem with a single solution or a single silver bullet is like trying to shoot at a freight train with a BB gun. It's not going to work. And last, in most cases, we actually don't know how to solve wicked problems fully yet. There's no existing solution we can put, pick up and slap on. There's no clear template to follow. We need new imaginative solutions. So where does that leave us? Who are we going to call? Entrepreneurs are the right people to take on these wicked problems. They can envision solutions that haven't been tested or implemented yet. But one Mark Zuckerberg or Steve Jobs going to war against a wicked problem isn't going to work. It's just as ineffective as the BB gun. But if instead a collection of entrepreneurs go up against a wicked problem by taking on its many interconnected pain points, then they may be able to move the needle. Let's call this different vision of entrepreneur superheroes and entrepreneur convergence. Over the last five years, I've worked with many entrepreneurs. And like most startup coaches, I instruct the entrepreneurs that I work with to start with a narrow pain point and develop a solution that both solves that narrow problem and delivers an effective uh, business model. But wicked problems are made up of hundreds of interconnected pain points. Single entrepreneurs simply don't have the resources to take on each one of them. But what could work, what is working in, many, in the case of many wicked problems, is an entrepreneur convergence coming together, taking on the wicked problem by taking it apart into its many pieces and developing a collection of solutions that can collectively solve the problem. I've seen the power of this type of collective impact in my work with education entrepreneurs. And I believe that instead of championing just the guys we talked about at the beginning, we need to champion the world-changing entrepreneurs that are doing so by working together in concert as an entrepreneur convergence. So that's what I want to invite all of you to do with me for the next couple minutes. Look at two wicked problems and look at the entrepreneur convergences that are coming together to solve them. First, we're going to start with education, which is one of the trickiest and most wicked problems of our time. 
specifically in college attainment. Less than one in 10 low-income students today persist to and through college. And given the well-known value of a college degree, this is a major barrier to economic mobility and opportunity. So for Ashley, who will be the first in her family to tr transition to and through college, she's facing a minefield of challenges. As a low-income student, she's more likely to apply to less selective colleges with lower graduation rates, and once she gets there, she's more likely to struggle in her introductory classes and not know where to turn to for help. But an entrepreneur convergence is coming together and delivering a selection, a collection of solutions that meet Ashley in the case of each pain point she's going to encounter. Let's look at how she's progressing now. Now, when Ashley's applying to college, she might use a tool like Overgrad, which will push her not just to apply to her safety schools, but to apply to her match and her reach schools. Match and reach schools have much higher graduation rates generally, but more than half of low-income students don't apply to a single match or reach school. Once she settles in on campus, her college might be using a tool like Persistence Plus, a mobile product that nudges students to take important actions, like enrolling in classes or talking to their advisor. Students using Persistence Plus have been shown to be five times more likely to seek tutoring help and have a 14 point higher percentage pass rate in their intro math classes. And once Ashley settles into her classes, her professor might be using a tool like Dropout Detective, which identifies a risk assessment for every student and nudges administrators and professors to take proactive action instead of waiting for students to fail. So when Ashley trips a little bit on her first midterm, her professor realizes it and connects her with needed resources. These entrepreneurs and the solutions they're developing are meeting Ashley at each step she encounters along the way. She's not encountering one silver bullet that solves all of her problems. And as colleges bundle together more solutions like that, Ashley and her peers will have a much stronger a much stronger set of resources they need to persist to and through college. Let's turn now to another wicked problem, climate change, certainly one of the most consequential of our time. One of the emerging solutions for climate change might be a greater reliance on alternative sources of energy, like solar energy. But making solar energy widely available and accessible is a wicked problem in its own right. So if a family just five years ago, or your family, was thinking of a solar installation in your home, you would have been facing a challenging road. Solar panels have been commercially available since the 1960s, but they've been too expensive and unwieldy for an ordinary homeowner to install. But now, an entrepreneur convergence is coming together to change all of that in the span of a few short years. Let's look at how your, your pathway to solar energy would have changed. Five years ago, one of the things that would have made your solar installation so expensive in your home was that it was hard for companies to find you, the consumer. And so all the money they spent in marketing and in advertising was passed on to you in the final price tag of your solar installation. But a company called Faraday is changing that and is making it easier for companies and consumers to connect. They've created a customer targeting software that identifies likely solar customers, like newlyweds with an infant driving a hybrid living in Cobble Hill or in Herndon. And because it's easier to find you, that additional cost is no longer in that cost and final price tag of a solar installation. Another thing that made it more expensive just a few short years ago was that even after a company found you, it took them a lot of time and therefore money to convince you of the merits of switching to solar energy. But today, Genability, another 
entrepreneur-led venture, has come up with a way that makes it very easy for both customers and companies to model the benefits of switching to solar and the cost savings in the long run. This, too, has lowered your ultimate price tag for your solar installation. And finally, just a few years ago, even if you had gotten to the point and said, yes, I'm ready to install solar in my home, you would have been facing a very tricky implementation. To actually hook up your new solar installation to the existing energy grid, it was tricky and dangerous and even required a master electrician to come out to your home. But this startup, Connector, has created a simple device that makes it very easy to hook up your, exist your new solar installation to your existing residential energy meter, dramatically lowering the challenges and cost of installation. These may seem like small innovations, but these entrepreneurs, alongside many others, have collectively lowered the price of solar installation by 400% in the last four years. And which means, over time, more and more businesses and homeowners will make that choice to switch to solar energy, which in the long run will make an impact on our environment and a dent on that wicked problem of climate change. In the case of climate change, college persistence, and many other examples we could look at together, one entrepreneur is not arriving with a silver bullet to save the day. A collection of entrepreneurs are coming together, are converging, are taking apart problems like this into their many pain points, and are delivering a collection of solutions that collectively can move the needle forward. So to go back to our initial question, though, how does this change our vision of what it means to be a world-changing entrepreneur? I believe we need to reimagine our archetype for that world-changing entrepreneur in this kind of environment where entrepreneurs have to work in parallel to one another to really solve our biggest problems. So what does that look like? I believe that the world-changing entrepreneur isn't going to be the one that dazzles us with the latest tech solution. It's going to be the entrepreneur that is willing to be collaborative, to share with other entrepreneurs, because they know that collective success matters more than just individual success. In the words of one of my mentors, solving problems this big is no time for a cowboy convention. And so what can all of us be doing to support this vision of entrepreneurs working collectively to solve problems? A few things I want to suggest. First, to my entrepreneurs out there, or maybe my future entrepreneurs who are going to tackle wicked problems, I challenge you to embrace a new set of core values. We already know that you're bold and results-driven, but I also challenge you to bring in the value of collective success over just individual success. Be generous and share with other entrepreneurs you work with and play the long game because problems this big are not going away at the end of the quarter or at the end of the year. To those of us who support entrepreneurs, like investors, universities, and governments, look for ways to create and champion networks of entrepreneurs where they can share resources and contacts and even customers because the greater the density and the convergence working on a given problem, the more that field will develop and grow. And finally, to customers, which all of us have the potential of being. If you encounter big, wicked problems in your work life or even in your daily life, look for ways to bundle multiple solutions together, knowing that there are no silver bullets. These are not small requests. Entrepreneurs and investors are pressured toward the quick win and competition over cooperation. Customers are usually looking for an easy solution to solve their problems. But I believe when the problems are this big and the more solutions at work, the better, the rules of the game need to change. In closing, I want to introduce you to Jess, an entrepreneur I've gotten to work with for the last few years. Jess and her co-founder, Evan, run a nonprofit 
that supports low opportunity youth to get into tech careers. This is an increasingly crowded field with dozens of organizations working on this issue in New York City alone. But Jess is unfazed by this competition. She recently told me, there is no competition when there are students left to be served. Jess knows that her wicked problem, diversity and technology, isn't solved yet. And she is happy to be just a small part of a massive convergence that's working to solve it. I hope we can all follow in her wise footsteps. Thank you.